Welcome to Words of Aloha with Pastor Izzy Manzo of Amazing Grace Ministries International. We're headquartered in Kailua Kona on the Big Island of Hawaii. Join us now as we get into God's Word. Father in heaven, we thank you for a beautiful day, Lord, for holding back the rain that we can meet on this beach. And Lord, we just pray now that just like that breeze blowing in uh, off, the, off the ocean to refresh us, Lord, we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to refresh us. We pray that you'd use Pastor Izzy even now uh, to, uh, to speak to us, to encourage us, uh, to give us this day and for this coming week the things that we need. We ask mm-hmm. that now in Jesus' name and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, bless the Lord, guys. Would you turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 10 as we continue our study in the Word this morning? We've been going over the examples of Israel, the things that they faced a lot of their um, times when they grumbled, they complained, they made bad, uh, what we'd say, decisions. Their, their judgment was in a pretty bad uh, way. Not that we ever have bad judgment. In, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, um, we saw that in verse 11, all of these things happened to the Israelites as what? As an example for who? For us. And this, all the things that they went through, if you ever wonder why I'm so big about studying the stories of the Old Testament, I, I got the privilege of being um, discipled by a man who was a, so knowledgeable in the Word. He knew all the Old Testament stories, and he knew, he would tell me, what's the best commentary on the New Testament? He said, the Old Testament. What's the best commentary on the Old Testament? The New Testament. So literally, you know, for, for some of you, you might have been exposed to, I, I heard this from quite a few different circles of my, uh, of my Christian exposure that they'd say, oh, but at our church, we, we're New Testament Christians only. We don't read the Old Testament. And I'm like, uh, but that's like got all the examples, you know, like, I don't know about you, but I'm one of those guys, when, a, when someone's trying to teach me something, I like good concrete examples of what they're trying to explain. I don't like the you know, uh, esoteric, made up, like not for real. Ex- I want, give me the real rubber meets the road. If this is, if this is a true thing, it's got to have some kind of like reality in, in life. And someone has to have lived it. And th- uh, anyone here agree that's a, g- a, a great way to learn is have somebody that's actually gone through it. I, I'm one of those guys, if I, can, if I can be around the person who's actually learned it and done it, like, especially when I was younger, I liked to learn about how to work on cars. I didn't like to learn about how to work on cars from reading this book, a manual. They, they didn't quite seem to describe how to actually do it. I like working with the old guys who had actually racked their knuckles a few times, you know, and wrenched on cars and knew how they worked. And, and I like to be around them because they showed me. You know, hands on, get your hands in there. This is why you do this. This is why you put the, the thread lock on this bolt. This is, you know, I, I learn really well. The same thing seems to apply to my faith. When I think about the things that I want to learn, why should I not do something or why should I do something? I want an example of some, something concrete. I want somebody who actually lived it, did it, and I can say, oh yeah. I'll, I, now, I, I preface this with, I'm allergic to pain. Let me just, just be clear here. I am a full-out appreciative learner of your mistakes. Not that I want to do them. I just want to learn the pain. Like if you said, I hit my thumb with a hammer and it really hurts, don't do this. I'm like, note to self, don't do that. I mean, I don't, I don't have to do it. I don't have to experience the pain myself. I, I learned from an old mechanic a trick when he was wrenching, and you know how when you're trying to break a bolt free and all of a sudden it gives, and then when it gives, you slap your knuckles into the sidewall or something in the, in, the, in the little tiny space that you're in there? He used to take a rag and put it in where his knuckles were gonna go when it broke free. Now I know it sounds too easy, right? That's just, you know, to reach, and he was one of those old mechanics that had the rag you know, like hanging out of the, of the he had these, I, I call them Farmer Johns. I don't even see anyone here wear them. But like this one piece kind of jumpsuit thing that you zipped up. You could wear whatever you wanted underneath because he wore it over. It's like this gray suit and he had this rag. That rag saved his knuckles so many times 
because he had the wisdom, pull it out, put it next to the part where the knuckle's about to go, and just have it there. And you still slap into it, but you don't, you don't cut the knuckle so bad, you know, when you hit the cloth as hitting the sharp steel. And as funny as that sounds, I would rather learn from that kind of example. Now, the Bible gives us examples of stuff Israel did that is worse than racking your knuckles. I mean, they really mess themselves over with some of their mistakes. But we got to the part where Paul says in verse, verse um, 11, these things happened to them as, as an example, and they were written for our instruction upon whom the end of the ages have come. Therefore, he said, and this is where we, we ended up last week, therefore let him who thinks he stands, what's he supposed to do? Take heed that he does not fall. If you think you got it down, I would never rack my knuckles. I'm, I'm in control. You, you ever run into those fellows? Like, they're, they're so good. They're not, I, would, I could stop the wrench before it would even hit into the metal. Yeah. If you think that you stand, he says, take heed lest you what? You fall. Whenever we get pride and think, I would never do that. It reminds me of Peter in the Bible, in Matthew 26, when he says, Oh Lord, even though they all deny you, what did he say? I would never do that. And if you, if you read Matthew 26, you go to the end of that chapter, you see that um, you know, they arrest Jesus and they haul him away, and as they're doing it, the servant girl goes, Hey, aren't you one of the guys What's with him? He's like, not me, not me. And then one of the guards, hey, aren't you, you, you talk like one of those Galileans, you know, and, and you, you talk like one of those followers of him. And, and it says he began to swear. I mean, he was a fisherman. He knew swear words. But he, he had been around Jesus for three years, and apparently that had, had kind of fallen away. And now all of a sudden, just to, you know, I got to cover my, my, my uh, you know, I, I don't want him to think I was really with that guy, because he's, sitting here following Jesus as they're arresting him. And, and, and he goes, you, you sound like one of those, one of his followers. And he goes, not me, man, blah, 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 blah. And, and denies the Lord a second time. How many times did he wind up denying the Lord that night? Three times. And Jesus, well, you guys know the part. Jesus said, before the cock crows twice, you will deny me three times that you knew me. Not me, Lord, I'll go to death with you. Now, there's a real example of a man, a real man, who said, I'm, I'm committed. I, I, does anyone doubt Peter's commitment? A anyone doubt his sincerity, that he really meant it? I don't. I think he really meant it. I think, though, when he saw Jesus being arrested and beaten, and as he was following, he's starting to realize, hey, if I get too close, what are they going to do to me? They're going to throw me in with him. You know, they're going to, I'm going to get beaten. I'm going to, something happened. And, and though he had all that courage when they were in the upper room around the table, as soon as it got out to the real beating, you know, let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. Now this, this is where we had to stop. I hate stopping there because the next verse we actually previewed uh, two weeks prior where it says there is no temptation that has overtaken you such as is common to man. It says, but God is what? He's faithful. And with every temptation, it says he will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. With that temptation, he provides something for you. What is it called? A way of escape. An escape hatch. Every time there's a temptation, the Lord always provides a way out. Now, do you have to take the way of escape? No. The longer I've been a Christian, the more I'm painfully aware. I say painfully because the times you don't take the way of escape, guess what you do? You fall into the temptation and then, well, you know, it's kind of like stepping into quicksand. It doesn't end well. Every time you muck up in, that, in, in falling into temptation, it's going to be not a pretty picture. But God oh, always, always, always will make a way for you to get out of that temptation but he leaves it in your court. Will you take it? And today we're going to continue this thought. Now, just keep in your mind 
all the stuff that Israel went through, the grumbling and the Lord dealing with them and sending the snakes to bite them, the, the complaining against the leadership, the, the making, the worshiping of the golden calf. Remember the Aaron we went over that last week? He threw the gold in the fire and out popped this calf magically that he, that he fashioned, it says. They told Moses it just happened. He says, all of this stuff happened so we would learn. We would learn, we'd gain instruction about what? I mean, they were worshiping a false, a false god. I mean, isn't that kind of like a big no-no in the Jewish culture? What's the first commandment on the ten, the list of ten? I am a jealous god, and thou shalt have how many other gods? No other gods. That's like number one. You are not to have any other god. No idols. Now listen to the next words of Paul in, in, in this chapter. Verse 14, he goes on and says, Therefore, my beloved, flee from, what's he say, temptation? Idolatry. No, he says idolatry. Idolatry. Now, idolatry is very, something that we don't really, I don't know, for some reason, we don't even think we do have idolatry in our country. We all, we're one nation under God, right? That means we're a Christian nation, we all serve God, right? Do, does everyone in our nation serve God? I wish we all served God. Some people are serving lots of other things as their God. In fact, they're serving some of the same things that Israel did. If I use them for the example, I got the, I mean, I don't even have to go far. How many, how many, of the, when Israel worshiped the golden calf, do we have anyone that worships gold in our country? Or money, you know, riches? We're not, we're not at all capitalistic and money driven, are we? I mean, go around the world and, and, and just take a poll in different countries. Which nation in the world is the most money-driven, capitalistic, money-loving? It's us. I mean, America has become world-renowned as the guys that go after money. But when I was young, I remember hearing a, a missionary talk of a story that he had gone over to the Philippines and he was sharing the gospel in an area where there wasn't, they didn't know about the Lord. And they had a lot of persecution, I guess, at that time from the communists. And this kid had gotten a penny, a U.S. penny. And it said on it, in God we what? We trust. And he thought America is the best nation in the world because they trust God, even on their money. They put in God we trust. So he, this little boy, this little Filipino boy, wanted to go to America. Oh, speaking of the Philippines, that reminds me. Our, our dear brother, uh, Jim, Jim and his wife, Shonda Davis, they've been, I've known them from early, early days of Calvary Chapel. They went to the Philippines to do church plants and, and orphanages, and they've been there for, I, I want to say, don't quote me, but at least probably like 25, 30 years that they've been in the mission field. In fact, we sent our assistant pastor, Don, and my son, Daniel, went to the Philippines to bring those guys some support from our fellowship. We sent support to them years ago to help them get Bibles to, to pass out. And Jim wrote in his newsletter, I put it in the dive box if anyone wants to see a picture of their family and, the, and, the, and help you pray for them. They said that one of the pastors there was arrested last year and he's been in prison being beaten for a year. And he was just released. And he, Jim asked for prayer for him because he, he um, you know, they, they, like whack, they take like bamboo and whack you back here behind your legs, you know, and, and, you're, and they wake you up. And so the pastor has been released and, and Jim says he, 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 he spiritually says, I forgive them. But he keeps having nightmares and waking up and, you know, like, uh, so he's asking us to pray for him that, Sorry, I don't remember the man's name, but God knows that we should pray for that man. That, that, I mean, you think, how easy do we have it to share about the Lord? We don't have someone arresting us and, and beating us. But see, that was when Peter was about to face that scene, Jesus getting beaten, it's funny how all of a sudden his, his story, his tune changed, didn't it? From I'll go to death with you to, I don't know, I don't even know the guy. Nope, I don't know him. Three times in one night. And then... Cock a doodle doo. And he remembered the words of Jesus. But Jesus told Peter something really interesting. He said, Peter, when you have returned, 
strengthen the brethren. Once you, like Jesus knew he's going to fail, but Jesus also knew that he'd come back. Now I love the Lord because he knows our he knows our our frame. Is there a whale behind me? Oh, just a little spray. Just a wee Keep watching. <laughs> right on the left side of the boat. Yeah. Left side of the boat. Okay, I'll preach this way today. <laughs> there it is. Right there in front of the boat. There's the back. See the tail? Yeah, right there. It's right there. It just po it just dove. Went. <laughs> yeah, it's just a little farther away than the boat is, and it's on the left in front of it. Keep your eyes right there. Listen to my voice. Watch the water. Listen to the word. It's not distracting at all. But see, I'm from Arizona. This is still fun to me. I don't know about you guys, but how many churches get to have live whale show? Whale watching. Put a little extra in the offering today. No, <laughs> I'm getting in trouble for that. that now they got to edit that out. You guys know I never ask for money. <laughs> Just, I couldn't resist. It was too funny. I still have humor, you know. At least my, my wife says I do on Sunday morning. Not the rest of the week. She says I'm a crumb the rest of the week, but you guys get the good side. And she, tell, she tells people this on the phone while I'm listening to her. You know, I am here, honey. I can hear you. Anyway, funny that the Lord would know Peter so well and that Peter would not know him, his own self that well. Peter was sure he would not fail God. I think sometimes we need to realize this. That the Lord knows us better than we know ourselves, doesn't he? And when, and when the Lord gives warnings, like take heed lest you think you stand because you might fall. When he gives a warning like that, that's kind of like saying, take heed that you put the rag there because you might, the bolt might break free and you might whack your knuckles. Just a take heed, caution. That's what heed is, right? Take caution. Take a little caution. Do we actually... When we hear spiritual instructions, do we say, yeah, note to self, I better get a rag and protect myself. Or I better do whatever they're saying and so that I'm protected from, from the harm that will come from making this mistake. When it, says, when it says here, therefore, therefore, my beloved, flee from idolatry. Do we actually say, hey, that's a warning. We should flee from anything that becomes an idol. It could be money. It could be, it could be a car. I mean, I have seen some men, they literally, they worship their car. Don't touch. <laughs> you know, and they, they, they just, they just, lo they love their car more than they love their spouse. I hate to say this. I've seen, have you ever run into a fellow that is so in love with his car? He, he loves his car more than anything else on the planet. That, that's, whenever your love for anything becomes greater than your love for God, because what's the greatest commandment Jesus said in the lawyer test him? Love the Lord your God. He didn't say love your car. He didn't even say love your spouse more than God. He didn't say love anything of this world. He said love God first. First thing you do is love God all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. Love him with every part of your being. The second thing, like unto the first, is love your neighbor as what? As yourself. He says, love God and love your neighbor, but not love your stuff. Not love an inanimate object. I love this car more than life itself. That's an idol. You just took an inanimate object and made it into an idol. So for some people, it's their collection of crystal or it's their collection of precious moments figurines. I used to, I only say that because my mother-in-law had this like wall with shelves, a little... And I was like, and they're like, don't touch those. Those are very valuable. I said, is this the idol shelf? You know, because they seem really important, like more important than, you know. No, no my mother-in-law loved the Lord. But she did have a pretty good collection of precious moments. I used to always laugh when I'd go and look at them. Little angel, do not be afraid. I'm not afraid of you. You know. Well, what, you, have any of you seen the little pastel precious moments angel? It's about that big. It's got a little fat round face. And yeah. In the Bible, the angel's always open. Do not be afraid. I wouldn't be afraid if one of those things showed up and said, do not be afraid. I'd be like, I'm not afraid of you. But that's not how angels really look, is it? 
it's funny how we 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 move things around in in our culture just by little artistic licenses and we call that something spiritual that is not even accurate if they would make an angel figurine that looked like a real angel you know about nine foot tall just 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 flames and bright light and just i mean we'd be like ah doesn't fit on the shelf though oh well nobody would buy it <laughs> not cute no one would buy it there's a warning here it says therefore my beloved flee idolatry should we really flee from things that we love more than we love god should we flee doesn't say just like tolerate or leave it in your life it says get away from it Fleeing means move away from that thing that is an idol. And Paul, he says this, I speak to you as wise men. You judge what I say. He says, it's not the cup of blessing with which we bless the uh, sharing of the blood of Christ, you know, talking about communion. Isn't that cup that we take of the, to remember the Lord? And is not the bread that we take of... Uh, 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 that we break a sharing of the body of Christ? Isn't that something special we do when we take communion? Now, we'll be taking communion. Usually we do it the first Sunday of the month, but I'm going to wait because in the next chapter is the part where we have the instituting of the Lord's Supper that Paul talks about. Let's do it in time with what the scripture layout is here. So in just a, in just a couple of weeks, we'll be coming to that part in, in chapter 11. But he says, since there is one bread... And we who are, are many are now one body. We all partake of that one bread. We all are just partakers of the Lord, is what he's saying. Mahalo for joining us. If you'd like more information about us, go to our website, AmazingGraceKona.com, and click the link to follow us on Facebook. That's AmazingGraceKona.com. Mahalo, and God bless.